Okay, everyone. So uh, we'll get started. We try to start as close to on time as possible for our lunch present lunchtime presentation. So uh, I'm Daniel Goldberg. I'm faculty here in the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, and I have the privilege of introducing my friend and colleague Kate Nicholson. I've known Kate for a few years now because um, we work in some similar areas. She's fantastic and amazing, and I'm thrilled to have her here. So uh, Kate is a civil rights attorney. She's an arts activist, and for the last few years in particular, she's been a writer and a speaker. Uh, she served in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice for more than 20 years and is a nationally recognized expert on the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's actually too modest. Kate basically ran ADA disability litigation for the Department of Justice. It's kind of a big deal for a few years, right? So um, Kate is based here in Colorado. She lives in Boulder, uh, and she consults on issues related to accessibility and social justice through ADA ADEPT and is president and founding member of the Denver arts nonprofit, Tilt West which was named in Best of Denver 2017 as the best think tank for arts and culture. So Kate has a strong connection to the arts community here. Kate is writing a memoir and speaking about her 20 year journey to healing after, he, after a surgery left her in severe pain, unable to sit, limited in standing and walking, and for many years bedridden. Kate also writes and speaks about social healing, art, and culture. She was a senior fellow at Dartmouth College, is a graduate of Harvard Law School. She has funding from the Open Society. And she is one of, uh, uh, she is a Mayday Fellow in the 2019-2020 cohort. We're both fellows. Along so, with Daniel Gold. So we're, yeah. we're both fellows there. And the Mayday, uh, the Mayday Fund, for those of you who don't know, is a, a relatively small nonprofit foundation that is particularly interested in issues of pain uh, and inadequate pain control. So they've been working on that for about 10 to 15 years. So I'm going to stop here and let Kate talk. And I look forward to um, uh, hearing what she has to say. Thanks. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start with a, a brief, reading you a brief excerpt from my personal experience to sort of frame the conversation. It's 1997. Beneath a row of interlocking chairs upholstered in imperial blue, I'm sprawled on the waiting room floor of a hospital as bright lights glare down on me. A recent surgical attempt to repair a previous surgical injury has failed, and I remain unable to sit or stand and in severe pain. When my name is called, my husband, Tom, reaches down and touching, touches me gingerly at first. Then he gathers me in his arms like a sleepy six-year-old child and carries me back toward the treatment rooms. Three years earlier, pain appeared rather suddenly. I was working at my desk at the Department of Justice, putting the finishing touches on a document due to court when my back started to burn. It felt vaguely like acid was seeping through my tissues and crawling to the base of my spine. Pressure built inside me, so I stood up, hoping to shake it off. But the pain was intensifying, spreading, radiating into my legs. My muscles began to cramp, and then my body seized up on me entirely, and I ended up in a face plant on the floor. I rolled onto my back, dazed and perplexed that a day which had literally become begun with a run up the mountain trails was ending this way. What I didn't know then was that my life had changed forever and that I'd navigate the next 15 plus years of my life in this exact posture, lying supine with my knees drawn upward. We're at the hospital today to learn what's next in my treatment and very much at the end of our collective rope. Only many years later will I learn what a turning point the failed surgery had been for Tom who upon hearing in the recovery room that I still had the exact same symptoms, walked calmly out into the hallway and crumbled, suffering his first ever anxiety attack as medics rushed to his aid. By the time we get to the treatment room, my body is on fire. Just getting to the appointment was an effort. Like some disenchanted Alice, I have fallen through a rabbit hole in which the ordinary tasks of daily living, bathing, dressing, riding in a car, loom large. When I shower, water morphs into fiery hot needles that pierce my skin. I'm able to take a few halting steps over a walker, but my progress is slow, like moving through molasses or cement, and each step exacerbates pain. But the worst assaults begin in the car, where I lay atop a half-inflated air mattress, a shock absorber for the jolts from the potholes and seams on the road. When my physician enters the room, he is joined by my physical therapist, my pain psychologist, and several others from the treatment team. It's unusual for all of them to be here, and I wonder briefly 
why he felt the need for reinforcements. It's time for us to switch gears, he begins, to stop trying to fix what can't be repaired. Stop? I don't know whether I said it out loud or if the word caught in my throat. I see rather than hear the next part. As I watch Tom write in large block letters, there will be no cure and the composition notebook he brings to each appointment, which he has affectionately titled My Book About Kate. Some 20 plus years later, I can still feel the distress of that moment inscribed in this notebook, letters so deeply etched that when I flip to the end of the notebook and run my fingers across the page, this invisible message remains. The thing is, my doctor continues, we've put you through painful procedure after painful procedure. We've tried dozens of medications, blocks, and infusions. I have a duty to do no harm. It's time for you to consider taking prescription opioids. Now, this moment was my lowest point in more than 20 years with intractable and then chronic pain. I was even angry. They're going to drug me up, I said to Tom in the car on the way home. Put me out to pasture like a damn racehorse. You have to try, he said firmly. We're out of options. You no longer have a choice. So ironically, given all of that, um, prescribed opioids really helped me. They didn't heal me. They didn't, I couldn't walk. Um, I couldn't move. But they allowed me to find traces of a life in really difficult circumstances. They were, for me, the worst, best option. When integrated with other approaches to managing my pain, they enabled me to work. I had to argue cases from a reclining folding lawn chair in federal court and conduct negotiations and oversee cases across the country in U.S. attorney's offices using video teleconferencing and draft briefs and regulations from a well-camouflaged bed, but I could still function and carry out a job. So chronic pain and opioids were not only a central theme in my life for the last 20 years, they've also defined the past 20 years in North America as well, part of a larger social tragedy involving opioids. Beginning in the 1990s, opioid prescribing increased, largely focused on managing chronic pain. There were bad actors, malfeasant pharmaceutical companies and pill mills, and a host of well-intended ones. The gravity of this crisis can't be understated, although this year deaths seem to be leveling off for the past three years. Um, life expectancy in America has fallen, largely due to drug overdoses and suicide. And nearly 2.1 million Americans have a use disorder related to prescription or illicit opioids. Now, much of what has been written about this crisis places the blame firmly on pain. We were duped into believing that we needed to care about it and to manage it. I would say it a bit differently. I don't think we were wrong to recognize the burden of pain. I think the flaw was in our solution. Instead of looking at and addressing the systemic reasons that pain remains undertreated, we threw opioids at the problem. What are those systemic problems? Well, one is that uh, a lot of research shows that uh, primary care doctors are not well educated in how to treat pain. So there's not a lot of pain curriculum in medical education unless one specializes. Um, pain doesn't represent a very significant portion of our research dollars relative to its prevalence and disabling consequences. And related to that, a lot of less risky treatments for pain are not accessible to people because they're not covered by payers. What we really have in my view is a syndemic, and that's a series of intersecting epidemics that affect each other in negative ways. We have undertreated and poorly managed pain, we have undertreated addiction, and I would say we also still have a problem with mental health treatment in this country. And the biggest cost has been to human life and quality of life. But the combined fiscal cost is also extraordinary. If you add up the costs due to undertreated pain and the costs of the opioid crisis, we're totaling over a trillion dollars every year. So I wanna talk briefly about the overdose crisis in relation to pain before moving on to talking about pain more specifically. Because the simple story that's told in the media leaves the impression that it is mostly people in pain 
who went to the doctor, were prescribed opioids, and are dying on the streets. And certainly some people were harmed in that way. I wrote an op-ed with a gentleman named Ryan Hampton. He went to the doctor for a bum ankle, was prescribed an opioid, and ended up with a 10-year heroin addiction. But our best data, the National Surveys on Drug Use and Health, show that actually um, most of the people who misuse prescription opioids didn't get them directly from a doctor. Depending on how misused is defined, somewhere between 80 and 63% of people who misuse actually took them from family and friends or bought them on the street. So diversion of that medical supply has been a much bigger part of the problem. Um, in addition, some 70% of those who discuss uh, misusing prescription opioids have prior substance use um, that goes well beyond use of alcohol and cannabis to include substances like cocaine and methamphetamines. But complicating things on the other side, the number one reason given for misusing a prescription opioid, some 62.3% of people, was to relieve physical pain. It also bears keeping in mind that most overdose deaths are what we call polypharmacy or polysubstance deaths. Um, they, don't, they usually involve multiple substances used in combination, some legal, some illegal. Alcohol is, fa is fairly often present. Um, some studies that looked really closely at people who had died from overdoses found that the average number of substances involved was six. And finally, um, it is important to note that deaths have uh, gone up exponentially in the last five to seven years, largely uh, when illicit fentanyl and its potent analogs came onto the scene. Um, things like carfentanyl we use to tranquilize elephants, so human beings don't really stand much of a chance. There's also been a large uptick in use of stimulants and stimulant-related deaths. So I say that just because I think it's important that we uh, sort of look carefully at what the problems are if we're gonna come up with reasonable solutions. But what of pain? I wanna show you a couple slides about pain. So where pain arises. This first slide is the top 10 reasons people give for going to a doctor. And the second is uh, sort of the major diseases. And you can see that pain is all over it. Um, in terms of the top 10 reasons people seek clinical attention, back pain, abdominal pain, headache, and leg pain, four of the top 10 are there. In terms of the major diseases, we've got osteoarthritis and joint disorders, back problems, chronic neurologic disorders and headaches, again, four of the top 10. Um, and then a couple others where pain can be correlated. Diet, people with diabetes can develop neuropathies. Um, anxiety and depression are strongly correlated with pain as well. But this is the biggie the global burden of disease. This is from the WHO, years lived with disability. And you can see that number one and number two are pain related. Back pain and headaches are the top two reasons people have long-term disability worldwide. We also have musculoskeletal disorders and neck pain, and then again, these things that are sort of correlated, depression, diabetes, anxiety, and drug abuse. Another inst interesting statistic is that um, the quality of life index for someone with moderate to severe chronic pain is considered the same as that for someone who is dying of cancer in very late stages of cancer. Pain is also very prevalent. Um, some 100 million Americans have some form of chronic pain. Now that's a very broad category. The ones that I tend to focus on are these latter categories. According to the CDC, 50 million Americans have daily or near daily pain. 40 million Americans, according to NIH, report severe pain, and nearly 20 million Americans, actually 19.6 million, have what I like to call life-altering pain. Technically, the medical term is high-impact pain, but I came of age in the 80s, and that always makes me think of aerobics. It just doesn't really do it for me. So um, it's really pain that interferes with your ability to partake in basic activities like caring for yourself or your family or going to work. So pain is highly prevalent. If you compare it with our other major chronic diseases, it's really on par with cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, but if you look in the second column at the research allocated, it's really underfunded compared to those other diseases. If you consider its prevalence, 
and disabling consequences. It's a little better. This is the 402 million was pre-heal dollars. Now we're up to about $670 million with the HEAL initiative, about a third of which is going to pain, but it's still underfunded relative to the others, which sort of begs the question of why. Well, one reason is pain doesn't kill you. Sorry, this is sort of a, a, blank, slide, <laughs> a blank slide for a moment. Um, it's two of my uh, heroes. Um, one is uh, the philosopher Albert Schweitzer, who says that pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death itself. Um, and on the bottom, Dr. Martin Luther King, who says, of all the forms of inequality, injustice and in health is the most shocking and inhuman. Um, so back to why uh, it matters um, that we research pain and why, why we have this kind of disparity in the budget. One of the reasons that often given is that pain doesn't kill you like these other diseases do, but really these other diseases are largely chronic as well. And so it's about sort of in, increased mortality risk rather than some, what's gonna kill you in an, acute session, in an acute sense. And by that measure, pain really isn't that different. Um, McFarlane et al. Um, examined a number of studies on mortality risk factors related to having chronic pain and concluded that for every decade a person spends in chronic pain, you can add about six years to their lives or reduce life expectancy by that number, which puts me at a sprightly 71 years old. There are other explanations as well. Pain is poorly understood. It is natural and protects us except for one extraordinary woman who was written up recently in the New Yorker and the New York Times, people who genetically can't experience pain don't live very long. So pain's necessary to teach us to rest and seek out care. But when pain is very severe, uh, as in the case of acute pain after surgery, we don't heal very well unless it's managed. And when pain becomes chronic, it can start to lose that protective function um, and actually do damage to the body, in addition to one's ability to participate in the activities of normal living. So why does research matter? I mean, pain, pain's been around forever. Why do we need to invest in understanding it? I'm gonna give you one hypothetical to begin with. Um, so studies show that about 70% of people with chronic pain are women. And women experience more pain and have more diseases that, that cause pain. But it was only in 2016 that NIH changed its policies and started to require that where relevant, researchers start using not only male animals in testing. As of 2015, before this happened, 80% of the studies featured in the flagship journal on pain, pain involved only male animals. And lo and behold, in our ever to endeavor to understand all of this, it turns out that at least in animals, entirely different cells are involved in pain processing. In male animals, the great insight about pain processing and why pain becomes chronic of the last decade has been the involvement of microglial, microglial cells. In male animals, it is processed through microglial cells. But in female animals, it's processed through T cells. So we are only just a few years into beginning to scratch the surface of understanding why women disproportionately experience pain. So that's one good reason that research matters, just our understanding of why it happens in the first place. And as an aside, um, that's just the sort of physiological differences. That's just sort of the the sex side of things. That's not even sort of entering into the equation uh, gender. Um, and how women are treated in the medical system. Um, and there are a fair number of studies that show that uh, women's health complaints across a variety of modalities are uh, sort of disproportionately discounted or disbelieved. This goes back to the lovely history of the wandering uterus and hysteria and our this belief that we can't really accurately report what's happening in our own bodies. Um, and I sometimes use the hashtag pain too in this me too era to sort of say that it matters to believe sort of the accounts uh, of women's suffering. But it's not just women. Um, people of color um, have also uh, have their pain discounted. There are studies that show uh, because of beliefs that still exist among clinicians that there are physiological differences um, racially 
that people of color's pain is rated two to three points lower on a pain scale than their white counterparts. And then on top of that, because of the way that we have prosecuted the drug wars in this country, even though uh, statistics show that white Americans and Americans of color use uh, drugs pretty equally, and that white Americans actually deal drugs more often, um, we have disproportionately, as we all know, um, locked up and prosecuted um, Americans of color. And so when they go to the doctor, um, they are also much more often perceived when they report pain as being drug seekers and not having their pain believed for that reason. So they sort of get it in both directions. Um, pain, as I mentioned, is a, a disability issue. Um, and there are other groups that are disproportionately affected, like veterans and older Americans. Um, but when you get down to it, it's a human issue. Um, and pain stigma affects everyone. I mean, Daniel has written a lot about this. Um, he's done a lot of work highlighting pain stigma, focusing on sort of subject, subjectivity and objectivity, um, and the history of pain without lesion, um, which is fascinating. I mean, in my case, um, it was not the lack of sort of objective tests that caused problems. It was because I had so many bad tests because I couldn't walk. So, you know, my imagery was bad. My, my nerve conduct conduction studies were horrible. And so I ended up, until they figured out what was going on, getting all kinds of false positive diagnoses from, you know, multiple sclerosis to ankylosing spondylitis and a whole host in between. And then I was treated for all of them. So just, you know, differential diagnosis still matters. Just looking at images doesn't tell you as much as we think it does. Um, Melanie Thernstrom has written about our religious ideas that pain should be born, that it builds character, um, and we can't experience pleasure unless we experience pain. Uh, she wrote about how anesthesia wasn't used for many years, um, about 100 years uh, fully after it, was, until after it was first discovered because of this idea that God wanted us to feel pain. Um, and Susan Sontag in Illness as Metaphor and later AIDS as Metaphor uh, has written about stigma in a compelling way, and she argues that diseases that are not well understood in their time and that are feared often cause people to uh, characterize those who suffer metaphorically. So we resolve our uncertainty and fear about it by characterizing uh, those who suffer. Um, the other reason that research matters is um, in terms of treatment. I'm sure you've all read that uh, opioids don't work for chronic pain. That's a bit of an overstatement of the research, but it is also true that we lack high quality studies on the efficacy of opioids past 12 weeks. This owes partly to the duration of drug trials that the FDA requires. It owes partly to the difficulties involved in having placebo controlled long-term styles uh, studies with real suffering people. Um, it also relates to the fact that chronic pain is this huge umbrella category. I mean, even going back to the charts I showed you about global burden of disease, if you look at something like back pain, you know, back pain can be neuropathic, it can be musculoskeletal, it can be visceral, it could come from an autoimmune disorder. There are so many different ideologies um, before we even get into the differences between people. Um, and so sort of presumably, if you have an inflammatory condition, different medications are going to work better for your pain than if you have a neuropathic one. Um, but it's also true that we don't have quite high quality studies for any other medication, really, to treat pain or any other treatment for pain. So that leads to a lot of difficulties, not just in how uh, these things are prescribed, but in also how they're covered by insurance. I'm on the board of a group that's trying to put together payers and researchers to work on this to get some better studies going because basically payers won't cover a lot of these alternative treatments that are less risky. So I'm gonna go back to my own story for a moment. Obviously, since I'm standing here before you, things got better for me. I had uh, for a while advancements in um, medical devices, I had a spinal cord stimulator, and that really helped. And then later, um, advancements in surgical techniques really helped. And I started to begin to use my legs again and walk. Um, and I moved out to Colorado uh, to sort of have a lifestyle change and really focus on healing and rehabilitating after 15 years lying down was not a small task. Um, 
But I had another experience in this sort of pain and opioids conversation that's really what brought me into advocating about this topic. So I went into my doctor one day uh, and she said, I'm not gonna prescribe opioids anymore and you won't find anyone else willing to in town either. And what had happened is that a local physician who was fairly well respected had prescribed to an undercover agent um, who was posing as a pain patient and got into the DEA snares and that really sent a chilling effect of fear through the local prescribing community. So I, I pled with her, I said, I'm already going down, can't you just give me a taper plan? Um, I understand it's not a good idea to stop these abruptly. Uh, and she said, no, I'm just gonna start doing, this is your 30 day notice, I'm gonna start doing procedures only uh, next month. Um, and I said, I, I, I really, you know, I'm almost there, can't you just help me with this? And, and uh, she actually said to me, um, I had a client or a patient who went to prison once and I'm pretty sure he survived. So that was sort of the end of the conversation. Um, and I was a little surprised and taken aback because generally going through the healthcare system, I had not been treated without dignity uh, or respect. Um, but luckily I had a prior treatment team in Washington DC. So I flew back there and they gave me a taper plan and the rest is history. I had no trouble tapering off. I was tapered appropriately um, and uh, am now doing well. But it gave me a sense of what might be coming uh, in the environment. Um, and I also sort of had a sense because my early work at the Department of Justice was in the last great health crisis of HIV and AIDS. Um, and one of my biggest cases, which went to the Supreme Court, um, was a case called Bragdon versus Abbott. And it basically was about the right to routine dental care for people with HIV and AIDS. Um, and probably a lot of people in this room don't remember what happened, but uh, the first case of transmission in a healthcare setting happened in a dentist office in Florida. And uh, ended up that that was sort of the only case of transmission in a dental setting was in this one dentist's office. And it was suspected that perhaps the infection was intentional, though that was never fully uh, vetted by the CDC, but the reaction to it was that my desk just piled high with complaints and everybody was being dropped in dental care um, because there was a lot of fear in the environment. Um, and we did have to win that right uh, all the way in the Supreme Court. So I was aware of sort of the chilling effect that could happen when we had uh, a, a crisis that involved a certain measure of fear. Uh, and sure enough, in 2017, I started hearing through the disability community about people facing increased barriers in getting access to pain medication, whether at pharmacies or at their physician's offices. So I decided to step into this conversation. Um, and sadly, I hear from dozens of complete strangers every week, because um, they've either seen my talk or something I've written, um, who are pretty desperate and uh, facing pretty serious burdens in their care. So um, I, part of this ticked up in, so my, my personal story happened in 2014. It was before any of this uh, with the CDC guideline happened. But in 2016, the CDC issued its guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. And much of what the guideline has in it is very useful to re-educate physicians. Um, it talks about trying non-opioid alternatives first. Uh, it says when opioids are used, they should be prescribed for the shortest possible time at the lowest effective dose. I mean, nothing that anyone could find uh, controversial. Um, and they were certainly necessary to correct a history of overprescribing. Um, the guideline itself is written as non-mandatory guidance for primary care physicians. But two of the more concrete provisions have been widely misapplied by policymakers. Um, despite being right on the face of the document labeled by the CDC as stemming from low or poor quality evidence. Um, and those two provisions are uh, the guideline for dosage, um, really an opioid initiation. Um, the CDC put in specific morphine milligram equivalents when starting a new person on opioids, uh, 50 to 90 uh, MMEs and the guidance for prescribing uh, uh, for acute pain, which is generally a three to seven day uh, prescription. So 
So what has resulted from this um, is something that started out as non-mandatory guidance um, and a, a sort of a guideline. We talk about rules and standards a lot in the law, a, a sort of a standard, um, even though coming from the CDC, it carried considerable weight, was lifted and turned into sort of a strict rule um, by policymakers throughout the healthcare system. So there are laws in 36 states now. Um, major pharmacy chains are setting day and dosage limits that are absolute. Uh, public and private payers are delaying and denying fills. There's a lot more oversight in the fill process. And, it, and in some extreme cases, um, they're tapering people altogether. I actually was able to fight back a policy in Oregon that was what I call a you know, good idea gone horribly wrong. Oregon was going to start to cover more broader treatments for pain, which is great. Um, but the expense of doing that meant that they were going to forcibly taper 150 people off of opioids without any protocols or safety plans or anything. They were just going to stop, uh, stop uh, those fills. And that we were able to get changed. Um, but it is an example, an extreme example of what's happening. Um, the DEA um, and DOJ have said that they use the dosage guidance in the CDC guideline when they're sort of looking at prescribing practices of physicians. And that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Policies exist at every level of government and the healthcare system. And we started seeing some evidence beyond just the anecdotal stories I was telling you about that I hear, people I hear from um, in the last year. Human Rights Watch um, issued a major report in December of 2018 that said that clinicians were tapering people involuntarily or refusing to treat them um, and largely about out of fear of liability and against their better medical judgment. And that's the problem. I mean, if someone needs to be tapered um, in your best medical judgment, there is no, that's not a problematic thing. It's, it's the, the ethical motivation for doing it. Um, this is a quote from one of the physicians interviewed. I turn away new patients. These are folks whose records check out and they are good citizens, but I can't afford to burn down my life and lose my license. The interagency task force that was assembled from the CARA, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, had similar findings. And then just recently, there have been a couple of studies. Um, the, uh, there was a study this summer conducted by the University of Michigan that found that 40% of primary care doctors would not take on a new patient who was already taking prescribed opioids for pain. Um, and there was another recent study that the Center for Addiction and Quest Diagnostics did, found that, which found that 81% were reluctant to treat such patients, even as 74% were afraid that their patients would turn to the illegal market if their prescriptions were denied. So there's a fair amount of fear and some evidence that this is happening. By the way, it's not just happening to people in pain, it's happening to people with opioid use disorder who use buprenorphine or methadone as well. The Department of Justice had a recent settlement agreement um, in which uh, an individual went into a, a practice uh, and just filled out the basic medical information. Do you have any medical conditions? Yes, I have an opioid use disorder. Do you take any medications? Yes, I take buprenorphine. Sorry, we don't treat you. And this was for primary care. This wasn't for addiction treatment. Um, and so both of those things are, are actually illegal under the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is illegal to discriminate against someone based on their medical condition or the medications that they take. Um, it's also ethically problematic, um, I think, to uh, you know, doctors. In some ways, the normal ethics are being turned on their head in this, with respect to this subset of, of patients um, because doctors have a duty to relieve suffering and to put their patients' interests uh, ab above their own and not to abandon their patients. So um, this is, is causing some, some overreach. Uh, and there also have been some sort of harrowing studies that have come down just in the last year about tapering. Now, again, tapering is a big topic. Um, people were put on high doses in uh, the early 90s. There was this idea that we just take people up to the level of palliation. Um, and a lot of studies that do careful tapering, uh, where people are, you know, where tapering is voluntary, where it's done slowly, where other alternatives for helping with their pain are integrated into the process, show that most people actually do better at lower doses, interestingly. But the way that it's happening in the real world with the sort of impact of laws and policies is problematic. So there was a study that came down 
um, about Medicaid beneficiaries in Vermont, for example. These are people at high daily doses of over 120 uh, MME for more than 90 days. And it found that the median length of time to discontinuing opioids was a single day, and that 49% had opioid-related hospitalizations or emergency room visits as a result. Uh, there was a study done here in Colorado by Kaiser that found that simply destabilizing dosage resulted in a threefold increase of an opioid overdose, even a controlling for dose. And there have been a few other studies that have followed. Uh, there was one at the University of Washington that had, came to similar conclusions. Uh, there was a New York study that showed that opioid discontinuation was associated with the solution and care relationships, um, and another study that showed that tapers were happening more often to women and people of color, uh, and that overdose risk does not go down due to opioid discontinuation. So in a weird way, we're sort of circling around to, you know, we, we wanted to prevent opioid-related overdoses. Um, and just in terms of the way this is happening in practice, we may actually be encouraging them. So I brought these concerns to the CDC in March of this year, along with some other folks. Um, and they agreed that their guideline had been widely misapplied. And they issued corrections in April. Um, they issued a series of three corrections. Uh, one, the main one was a, a, a article written in the New England Journal of Medicine by the original guideline authors, saying that policymakers were misapplying their guidelines in ways that risked patient safety and harm. Uh, another was a letter from Director Redfield um, that clarified a lot of things. Uh, one was that the guideline doesn't endorse or mandate abrupt dose reductions or discontinuations because this could hurt people. Um, that it has recommendations to taper only when patient harms outweigh the benefits. That is the relevant calculus, not just the dosage that someone's on. And the guideline, uh, he clarified also that this 50 to 90 MME was not ever intended to apply to people who had been on opioids long term or who were taking them for a long time, which is some 8 to 13 million Americans, according to studies. Um, but the, really, it was intended to help people with opioid titration when you were starting somebody who was opioid naive on opioids. And the CDC is now in the process of redoing its guideline. They put out a call that I think stopped February 7th for people to be involved. Concurrently, the FDA also issued a relabeling and a warning, um, basically because they had gotten so many reports of sudden opioid discontinuation. They issued a new label for all opioid pain medications with recommendations that any tapers be individualized and gradual. And then just recently, HHS came out with what's actually a very good guideline on opioid tapering. So um, I think, I mean, this is sort of the basics uh, of what's happened in the current environment. Um, I want to go back to this sort of idea um, of a syndemic. I really think the only way we're going to get our hands around this problem is to start uh, treating both pain and addiction. And addiction is much bigger than just the 2.1 million people who have an opioid use disorder. Uh, some 22 million Americans have some form of substance um, misuse addiction. Uh, and our treatment protocols for addiction are even worse <laughs> and even less well-regulated than they are for people with pain. Uh, so my feeling is that um, the only way we're really gonna get our hands around it is to look at both of these things in a comprehensive way um, and start investing in solutions. So this was just a, sort of to give you a general overview of uh, opioids and pain. There are lots of ethics issues that arise. Um, that we could discuss in the q and I just did a, a paper for the American Journal of Law and Ethics on the fact that the ethical duty to do no harm has been used to justify both sides of the swing on opioid prescribing, ironically, um, and sort of, sort of looking at how this was different from the ordinary medical case to see if we could elucidate some better principles that would help guide us in the future so we don't repeat what's happened in the past. Um, there are issues related to increased oversight that have come up that raise ethical uh, and legal issues. 
Um, I recently gave a talk on prescription drug monitoring programs. These are programs that exist in every state, and anytime you fill a prescription um, for a controlled substance, which is a big, a big range, this is well beyond opioids, it's testosterone, it's all kinds of medications that are scheduled, um, it goes into a, a, a monitoring program that now exists in every state in U.S. territory, um, which in many ways is good. A lot of clinicians consider it to be an absolutely vital and useful tool because they can check and see what medications people are taking. Um, and people don't always remember to report, you know, even if it's totally honest, uh, you know, which medications they're taking. So I think it's a, it's a useful clinical tool. But the problem is that they've expanded so quickly that they've uh, moved out away from our ability to sort of protect that medical information. And so there are no federal privacy protections for that information whatsoever. HIPAA doesn't even apply. Um, some states have enacted some privacy protection, but that really depends on the state. Um, and there is also um, law enforcement uh, can get access to all of this information without a warrant, um, which has led to some problematic results. There's actually a case in New Hampshire right now in the First Circuit that the ACLU is litigating on that Fourth Amendment law enforcement piece. So we'll see. Um, there was a Supreme Court case on phone records, and the idea is whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And, the argument was, well, if you buy a cell phone, you've given up your records, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. And that, uh, the Supreme Court decided that wasn't correct. And so the idea with the PDMPs is, well, you fill a prescription, you're consenting. Um, and uh, the ACLU is arguing, well, that's more like phone records. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and with that, we can open it up to questions. When we do questions, um, please hold down the button in front of your microphone. Um, it, 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 you actually have to hold it down to talk. It'll, it'll illuminate. There'll be a red light, so you'll be able to ask, OK? Yes. Thank you for a really excellent and well-documented uh, talk. Um, I'm wondering, I'm left wondering, though, can, can you tell us What's your chief message to us in a, in a sentence or two? I mean, what, do, what do you really want us to take away? Um, I want you to take away that, uh, well, policies are affecting people. Um, and I would argue people that we have a special duty to in a negative way. I would argue based on Good Samaritan laws and uh, ethical regulations related to um, medical trials and these things. Usually when we put a patient into a a situation or we don't have a backup. We don't have a duty to uh, rescue someone if they're drowning. But if we go in and start to help them, then we have a duty, right? Our duty. And I would argue that these patients didn't put themselves on opioids to begin with and to abandon them in care is particularly problematic because we should have a higher duty in that situation. Um, and I, there's plenty of uh, ethical arsenal for that. Um, there are lots of articles about people who've been involved in medical trials and having higher duty there. There's even sort of a higher duty, um, I think evidence of higher duty given to cancer patients because about a third of people with cancer um, continue to have long-term pain even after the disease is gone. And it becomes sort of hard to um, distinguish that kind of pain from general chronic pain, right? If there's no progressive disease. Um, but we usually will continue to treat them. And in fact, the CDC specifically said that those patients are, are, are covered, that nothing in their guideline applies to patients with cancer. And so I think part of the reason we do that is because we started treating them. And oftentimes their pain can result from the treatment itself. Uh, so I would say we have a higher duty to those patients. We need to be, you know, we swing in this country. We swing from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. We swing from too much prescribing to cutting back. So I'm concerned about the people who are falling through the cracks. But I also think in a bigger sense, um, my message is that we really need to treat pain and addiction. You know, we really do. Um, we need to invest in both uh, and we need to take them seriously because I don't think we're, you know, we're gonna get very far unless we do that. I would agree with you, of course, that we have a special duty to those patients. It's easy though also to sympathize with the practitioner who, oh, who, absolutely. You know, who, who fears overreaction uh, from the DEA. And, and good to know that they're reconsidering these guidelines. Now. Yeah, and the Senate, uh, the Senate Health Committee is gonna be doing a hearing about that uh, in the next session. Uh, I've been working with them on it. Absolute, I have absolute <laughs> practitioners, no question. 
Um, I mean, I think it's uh, people are, patients and doctors are, are sort of caught in the crosshairs here. Um, and I, uh, and even, you know, doctors who were blamed and shamed for the opioid crisis, right? I mean, even, like I said, most of what happened was well-intended people doing what they thought was right. And honestly, federal guidelines got in the middle of that too. You know, quality control metrics and stuff were set by public health agencies, um, that encouraged more liberal prescribing that didn't even start with doctors really. So the, you know, it's complex, this interaction between sort of, uh, policymakers and physicians, I think. I'm sorry. Yeah. Isn't it easier to prescribe drugs than to sit down and talk to a patient and find out what's really going on? Well, you know, I think there was certainly that feeling in the, in the 90s, um, for sure. Um, and I also do think that diagnosing chronic pain is hard, you know. Um, and there is a disincentive to, you know, but I also think, as I said, with my experience where I got misdiagnosis after misdiagnosis for years, um, it's really important. I, my hope lies in precision medicine and not just in these big amorphous categories where we have one medication for all back pain or something, but actually that physicians and our research will start to get a better sense of what's, what's actually underlying and causing the problems to begin with. But yes, I mean, the interesting, you know, there's this uh, thing I was looking at around the room about electronic medical records, you know, and you read about that, that that's taking doctors away from interacting with patients, but that also it's increasing burnout and doctor suicide. And, you know, there are a lot of things that we're trying to do to improve things that sometimes are making things harder. Well, that too. Yeah. I guess on the patient side, you didn't really talk about patient advocacy for themselves. Like, if right. a, like how much should a patient advocate for themselves? Clearly you did. I also had chronic pain for a long time. I got misdiagnosed for 10 years yeah. and finally have gotten a solution. But yeah, that was through me, like advocating for myself ridiculously, and a lot of people don't. And so I'd be yeah. curious your thoughts on patient advocacy for themselves, not just on the law side and the policy side as well. Yeah, I'm actually giving a talk about that tomorrow, ironically. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really important, um, and on the one hand, and, and I, that's why I do try and arm patients with this knowledge, too, because I think if you don't have the knowledge, it's hard to advocate for yourself, but it's really hard to advocate for yourself when you're in horrible pain. You know, it is, and it's hard, it's a, it's a rough expectation to put on someone. Um, so I always say bring someone with you if you can. Again, that limits people, but I, I, you know, when my husband was in the room with me, they paid better attention to me. I mean, that's just, you know, human nature, right? Somebody cares about you, so we will too. Um, but also there was someone there taking notes and paying attention, um, which can be hard when you're in distress. Um, so yeah, I'm a big believer in uh, arming patients with information and in patient advocacy, um, but I think it puts a burden on someone who's suffering as well. I wanted to circle back to cannabis. You mentioned it briefly, but I wondered what your thoughts were on the substitution conversation and what a physician's obligations are to present alternatives in the, in the tapering conversation. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, the cannabis stuff is interesting. The culture has sort of gotten out ahead of the medical research in this. Um, and I worry a little bit about the one size fits all repeating itself because, you know, that's kind of what happened with opioids. And although cannabis seems to be safer, um, one medication does not going to work for every person with a variety of different conditions. And so making it a clean substitute is, uh, I think, problematic. Um, you know, we're lucky to be in a state where it is legal, and so now there can be more research about it. Uh, but, um, and that sort of has been the problem with the research, right? It's hard to, it's hard to do a lot of research on something that's, you know, that's considered illegal. Um, so I, I think it may hold promise for some people, uh, and certainly for some conditions, uh, like seizures and certain things, it really, there is pretty good evidence basis for it. But, you know, I think the, the you know, we don't know yet, really, uh, is the answer to that. Um, and I do think that, you know, compassionate doctors are providing, um, alternatives. The thing that I find interesting about the tapering conversation in terms of providing alternatives is that the, the studies that are best on tapering 
are basically sort of circle back to what we know works best for treating pain, which is sort of an integrated multimodal approach where someone has, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or meditation, which I use every day still to control my pain, um, and physical therapy and a lot of different treatment modalities combined. The best studies on the tapering side do that as well. So part of it is just giving, you, you can tell people about alternatives, but they're, they're not covered by insurance. You know, if they're not accessible, that's a real problem. And I was lucky enough to be treated in two multidisciplinary pain clinics at the National Rehabilitation Hospital in DC and at Johns Hopkins. Um, but if you don't live in a city, um, and depending on your health insurance, you know, those, those options may not be available to you. So I actually had a couple different thoughts. Um, I don't know if you touched on this because I unfortunately came in a few minutes late. Uh -huh. um, but you know, originally, like it's been in the news a lot, how originally opiates were meant only for terminal cancer patients. Like it was not meant to be such a widespread usage. Um, and I feel like providers are being blamed a lot for that. Whereas it was really like pharmaceutical companies who were told by their supervisors to lie to insurance companies and things of that nature. And then pharmaceutical companies started developing more concentrated, more addictive opi opioids. So um, perhaps you know like where that is heading because like I feel like a lot of this legislation is targeted at providers and it's not targeting any of the pharmaceutical companies who are really, you know, misrepresenting misrepresenting these medications yeah i mean i think you know i think there was less concern about terminal cancer because when you're weighing the risks if someone is going to die um, and cancer is a degenerative progressive illness which can have different implications for long-term treatment in terms of how you treat it although there are degenerative progressive illnesses that cause pain that aren't cancer too um, you know, I think there's a lot of blame to go around. Um, I, I do think pharmaceutical companies are getting their day in a big in a big way at the moment. Um, and uh, you know, I do think, uh, as I said, policymakers encouraged to prescribe broader prescribing as well. So um, I, I do think that the people who end up falling down the hardest are usually the victims of of the situation, um, which is people who you know develop a use disorder or people in pain. Who are now being tapered, um, or or they're treating professionals. Um, that's just, I think, unfortunately, sort of how it goes. But I, I do think there's definitely a reckoning happening, for sure, <laughs> at this point. Well, um, she oh she's gone. She mentioned patient advocacy, but yeah. not a lot of patients have the ability to advocate right. for themselves. And you know, my work in mental health has shown me that it's kind of like someone gets in a car accident. They may get depressed because they have chronic pain right. and then they get prescribed opiates and then they get addicted to the opiates and it's, and suddenly it's like, oh, they're a mental health patient and they're addicted and that's, you right. know, like, right. and, you know, it, it goes from, yeah, it goes from yeah. just being like, this is a medication do you need to, oh, you're an addict. So we get right. to ignore you. Um, so not every patient has that ability to advocate for themselves. And you even said, like, sometimes when it's like your partner is in the room with you, yeah. they, you get better care. So um, where do you see that going in the future? Like more advocacy on healthcare providers part or is that responsibility to fall to the patient? I'm hopeful it will have somewhat of a social reckoning about all of these issues um, because I think you're right with the mental health component too. Um, that we still don't treat those issues very effectively. Um, and I am hopeful that we won't just prosecute our way out of this, that we'll actually come up with, you know, some solutions. Um, again, I'm a lawyer, so I look at law and policy, right? Um, but there are some of the CARE Act that Elizabeth Warren and former Representative Cummings came up with is fantastic. They really heavily invest in addiction treatment and mental health treatment. So, um, you know, whether we can get something that expensive through a bipartisan Congress is another idea, but I think there are people out there with ideas. I think there, I work with a group uh, that we started called Changing the Narrative. It's mostly people, uh, reporters and people working in the addiction space um, that sort of talk about the stigma of this and what we can do and uh, work. It's focused more on the media, but also on policymakers with messaging because a lot of the messaging out there is very simplistic and very stigmatizing. Um, so I think advocacy can happen at every level. 
Uh, and I don't think it should just be reliant on people who are suffering. I think that's an unfair uh, burden to place on them. Because you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and you're suffering. You're not at your best advocating if you're miserable. I mean, that's just, you know, it's just a fact. So, Bart, um, sure. so you talked a little bit about your pain, like other modalities that you worked with. Do you care to elaborate on that? Um, sure. Oh, I, I've used a whole lot of different things at different points in my illness, which is varied at different times. Um, I started really early on using acupuncture and, and some of these things because I was doing reading um, and going to a psych psychologist well before I was transferred to a, a pain therapist because I just was doing reading on my own when they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, and I found those to be useful um, therapies. Um, I do use, I mean, I find of the, of the pain psychology therapies, meditation is something that for me works the best. I do it an hour every day. Um, I think it can really help downregulate an upregulated nervous system, which happens when pain becomes chronic. Um, I am a big believer in physical therapy and activity where that's possible. I think, you know, there are a lot of things out there, but the point is that they work for different people at different times or even differently for the same person at a different stage in their illness. So, I mean, my feeling is that we need, this vouchers have a bad name, but in, that the payers need to provide people with sort of, you know, vouchers or something so that people can try a few different things and see what might work um, for them. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the best evidence we have is from sort of integrated care for, for pain, probably is for mental health issues as well. <laughs> So is it then just the incremental use of alternative therapies that led to your uh, recovery? Because your recovery seems so dramatic. I'm looking for the lightning bolt it is and how you found your way out of the rabbit hole. Well, let me tell you a story. I mean, it, 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 I started to improve when I got a spinal stimulator. I started to be able to do a little more physical therapy, still couldn't walk, but that helped some. And then they actually went in and did a surgery where they were able to remove, so basically the theory is that um, I had my uh, part of my spinal cord severed, and the theory is that, that uh, sort of scar tissue got embedded in there and caused the problems for me, because it happened during the healing process, and they were able to actually remove some of that many years later, which made a huge difference for me, but it wasn't over then, so I, I moved out here, I learned to walk again, I thought it was done, I thought, you know, I'm good, and I was hiking one day at Brainerd Lake, that's how good it got. And my legs started getting weak again. And it turned out that um, my spine had separated. So I didn't have any discs left in my lower spine and my vertebrae were fractured. And when I got up and around a lot and was putting pressure on them, um, I started to have an issue again. And it's hard to know whether that was from lying down for all of those years or whether there was a weakness there to begin with, who knows. Um, but uh, the reason I'm doing so, so well is that I have a German engineered spine now. <laughs> I went to Germany. So um, in, uh, in the United States, they would just fuse it. And the problem for me with that, or the reason my doctors were afraid of that, even though the studies on fusion are better when you actually have sort of some kind of separation, was that my, the rest of my spine looks pretty rotten. And they were worried if they fixed the bottom part of it, I would be looking at surgeries for you know, every five years for the rest of my life. So we did all this research um, and found out that in Germany, they do multi-level disc replacement that allows the, the spine still to be flexible and move. So um, in 2017, I had that done and it has been amazing. I mean, <laughs> remarkable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. With time, so um, everyone, let's uh, thank Kate. Thank you so much, Kate. Welcome. So thank you all for coming for Ethic Bites. Um, I don't actually know what our next one is, but we have these pretty regularly. So just keep an eye on our website and our social media channels and you'll find out. Thanks.